Tens of thousands of workers made a handsome living in mills that were five, six, sometimes seven miles long. The incredible output of 100 million tons a year seemed almost easy. While the industry itself has undergone major changes over the years, the process of making steel has remained remarkably consistent. Iron ore gives us iron, and iron is what's used to make steel. The difference between iron and steel is the amount of carbon in each of them. Steel is the product that results if carbon can be driven out of the iron. The greatest challenge to making steel was finding out a way to remove carbon from iron. For over 5,000 years, civilizations have been struggling to unlock the secrets of iron and steel. The first use of iron really involves taking pieces of meteorites. People were able to shape uh, these uh, fragments, these pieces of material, this metal from heaven, and it fascinated people. King Tut's tomb, dating back to 3000 BC, reveals the incredible value placed on iron. While the casket was made of gold, the iron implements of the young king were sewn into his garments. They included a mallet and a dagger. Iron was so valuable because of its mysterious origins. The discovery that iron existed just under the Earth's surface led to experiments which would soon uncover some of the mysteries of iron. The entire business of forging, puddling iron was considered the work of an artisan because so little was known scientifically that it was really handed down often father to son. By the 13th century, there were two ways to transform iron into steel. The first was to manually pound out the carbon and the other impurities. The second was to heat the iron to a temperature in excess of 2,500 degrees. This forced the carbon and other impurities out of the iron and left steel behind. For centuries, craftsmen could rarely achieve the 2,500 degree heat required to drive the carbon out of the iron. Since even an open flame only reaches 500 degrees, oxygen was blown in from the side to fan the flames. During the Middle Ages, improved methods for increasing the heat had been developed, but the manual process was still the only way that the carbon could be driven out. Hot liquid iron was strange and unpredictable. Those who knew its mysterious ways were treated like royalty. What's generally not understood is that steel is iron. Through the ages, there were groups that figured out processes that were handed down from ironmonger to ironmonger of making this refined type of iron that was steel, that was stronger, that wouldn't break during sword fights. One group, the Damascus sword makers, toiled over hot flames for 14 to 16 hours a day. With brute force, the iron was pounded again and again, the carbon driven out, and a steel blade shaped like a sword was the result. One sword could take days to make. To test the blade, a slave was summoned, and his head was cut off. If the sword held its edge, it was ready for battle. No matter what the product, an ironsmith had to be as tough as the metal with which he worked. By the 1700s, England was the center of steel production. But soon, England's iron industry was in trouble. The problem was finding a fuel to heat the iron. Wood from the forests was being depleted at an alarming rate. To make one ton of iron, it took 10 acres of forest. The tiny island nation that ruled the world found itself unable to meet its own energy needs. A new, undeveloped land across the ocean, America, offered England her best hope. But America's vast natural riches would prove difficult to tap. Colonists built the first mill in 1622 at Falling Creek, Virginia. They worked day and night, pressing every man and woman into service. The Native Americans living in the area were angered by the strange behavior of the intruders. Determined to drive them out, the Native Americans attacked the mill just as the first fire was being stoked. All 348 members of the colony were killed, save for one young boy who escaped to tell a neighboring village the grim tale of the attack. 
22 years later, a mill was built in Saugus, Massachusetts, and the first American iron was made. The Industrial Revolution was just beginning, and colonial America was hungry for materials to build. But it became clear that the two types of iron, cast iron and wrought iron, had limitations. The cast iron is a very strong, however relatively brittle material. Wrought iron is lower carbon, but it doesn't have the strength of the cast iron. For America to be transformed into a juggernaut of industrial might, a way would have to be found to make steel affordable and easily available. And a brilliant entrepreneur was about to accidentally stumble onto a secret worth millions. We now return to steel on modern marvels. By the late 1860s, the age of iron had arrived. The iron horse linked the coasts. Over 50,000 miles of track had been laid. Travel was easier, but it wasn't always safe. There would be what was called snakes, which would be an iron rail that would break out of its moorings on a tie and would swing up, come through the wooden frame of a car and impale whatever was in its way. And this was one of the real awful and threats of traveling in those days. Iron brought America into the industrial age, but a stronger metal would be needed. It took an Englishman, Henry Bessemer, to unlock the great mystery of steel. Bright and ambitious, Bessemer had shown early in his life a penchant for inspired invention. Bessemer, penniless and desperate to make money to marry, invented a perforated stamp which put an end to the English practice of illegally reusing stamps over and over. His invention saved the British Post over 100,000 pounds a year and made him a wealthy man, but it was nothing compared to what was in store. Bessemer was about to solve one of the greatest mysteries of the industrial age. In England, they were producing this crucible steel. The question that was on everyone's mind was how could we produce a product comparable to say the crucible steel of Sheffield England on a large scale and cheaply. Bessemer had started on the road to his discovery by designing an improved artillery shell. The new bullet-shaped shell was an improvement over the cannonball but to be sent great distances a stronger metal would be needed for the gun from which it was fired. Bessemer knew that steel would work, but in the 1850s it was still virtually impossible to heat iron to the 2500 degrees that were required to make steel. Bessemer made an unusual discovery. What he found is that by introducing a blow of cold air under certain conditions that it would ignite the iron into twice its heat uh, up to 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. And by doing that he could drive off the carbon in the iron and then by reintroducing it could begin on a controlled basis to produce steel he didn't understand all the metallurgical implications of what he was doing in fact no one did the science was fairly simple Bessemer's process was called a converter because the chemical process that took place literally converted iron to steel oxygen blown from underneath combined with the carbon and created a chemical reaction that created even greater heat. So effective was the conversion that all of the elements were driven from the iron. A small amount of carbon was reintroduced, creating steel. Many men would harness the new process in places like Chicago, Youngstown, and Sparrows Point. But one man would soon tower over them all. Andrew Carnegie was the poor immigrant son of a Scottish rag merchant. Short in stature but quick of wit, he'd come to America at age 11 and quickly embraced the values of his new home. He was a telegraph boy and he began working for the Pennsylvania Railroad but immediately caught the eye of the uh, future president of the railroad, Tom Scott. It was through Scott and Scott's boss at the time, Edgar Thompson, that Carnegie got the money to build and to go into the steel industry. 
By his early 30s, Carnegie had amassed a sizable fortune as a manager for the railroad. His strategy was simple, invest in companies doing business with the railroad he represented. It was his investment in iron that brought him into what he believed would be the business of the future, steel. He began by buying steel mills. The capital was provided by investors he'd met as a railroad executive. Soon he was gobbling up companies that sold coal and coke to heat the furnaces. And the mines that produced the iron ore. Carnegie's lessons with the railroad served him well in building his steel empire. Carnegie was a finance man. He was not an engineer. He was not really an innovator. What he, what he was is he put the various elements together. And he was a tremendous promoter. By controlling all aspects of production, Carnegie could keep prices low and profits high, but there was one cost that he couldn't control, labor. Initially a friend to labor, Carnegie found himself increasingly at odds with his workers. You had a process which takes the production of steel from the hands of the artisan and puts it into a mass production where you're able now to set up a process that no longer involves skilled and semi-skilled labor and are able to produce unlimited supplies of the most versatile engineering material. This had a tremendous impact on the world, on the technologies of America and Europe. Mass production was the order of the day in the industrial world. Mills on a massive scale had to be run 24 hours a day to maximize their potential. Mill owners like Carnegie wanted to cut wages. The workers were determined to hold on to their pay. The stage was set for one of the bloodiest disputes in the history of American business. In the late 19th century and well into the 20th century, American steel was the greatest industry on earth, but the burden of greatness was borne on the back of labor, and no man had benefited more from labor's efforts than Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie had built the industry by cutthroat competition and by controlling virtually all aspects of production, but his influence didn't stop inside the mill. He fostered a system that would last well into the 20th century. The relationship between the company and the citizens of the town was very much like a, you know, the, a feudal relationship between lords and, and serfs. Um, people were dependent often on the, the company store. Their homes were often bought through the company so that politically it was hard for people to organize, for example, out of fear of, of losing their livelihoods and losing their homes. Life in a mill town was hard. The steel towns were very smoky. Workers often suffered from diseases like pleurisy. You can imagine how hot a steel mill would be and then in the middle of winter in Pittsburgh, uh, going from this, this extraordinary heat into uh, winter cold. While they had state-of-the-art equipment, this was not benign equipment. It was a high number of dangers in these mills. In fact, there were arguably much greater dangers because the mills were huge. There were cranes overhead, trains shuttling back and forth. There was deafening noise. There was intense heat and sparks. The steel industry got more and more dangerous as it became more and more advanced in terms of its product. Metal boiling at 2,500 degrees could drive temperatures inside the mill well over 100 degrees and make life unbearable for the worker. Sweating provided the only natural defense. Popular lore has it of steel workers stripped to the waist and sweating over these pots of, of metal. The reality was is they were swathed in, in sweaters, in cloth, in gloves. They covered everything because the sparks that would come out as they quickly would dart in to throw in some coke, dolomite, or other ingredient that was needed, the sparks would come out and burn you. Many of the men believed uh, in, in drinking steaming hot coffee all day long, even in the dead of summer, because it would keep you at this sweating. Making steel was unlike any other job. 
A greenhorn wouldn't be told on his first day at work that he shouldn't keep his spare change in his pocket. He would get little burn marks. And there are many great jokes about the different types of food that the wives would pack for the workmen, about how a sandwich that would be packed would turn green within an hour in the mill. In 1890, Homestead, Pennsylvania, just six miles outside Pittsburgh, was like many other steel towns. Mills like Homestead were running virtually 24 hours a day in order to meet the railroad's voracious demand for steel rails to replace the iron rails. By 1890, Carnegie controlled virtually every aspect of the steelmaking process except one, labor. Steel rails were not only better than iron rails, they were around half the price. That in turn caused pressure on labor wages. The key thing, although it could not be stated publicly at the time, was to break the amalgamated iron and steel worker, which was then a very strong union. And at Homestead, they were very strong. So strong, in fact, that Homestead was to become the battlefield upon which the war over wages would be fought. Events were about to unfold which would determine the future of the steel worker for the next half century. If workers at Homestead could be brought to heel, other mills would follow. Both sides had reason to mistrust the other. The workers felt constant pressure from management to accept lower pay. Traditionally, workers were paid by the ton. A steel worker could make anywhere from $35 to $85 a month, depending on the skill level. This at a time when a modest home rented for about five dollars a month. As the equipment improved and the tonnage increased, workers believed that wages should follow. Instead, management tried to cut wages to boost profit. Carnegie felt pay cuts were justified. After all, he had spent vast sums to modernize his plants. It was the new machines, not the men, that increased productivity and thus profit. To work with steel, the worker no longer needed to be a highly skilled craftsman. He was just another part of the machine. Both sides believed they were right, and it was at Homestead that the battle lines would be drawn. Carnegie put the problem into the hands of his trusted associate, Henry Clay Frick. Frick was a fascinating, albeit reticent, man. His grandfather was a whiskey maker, and Frick was an austere, penny-pinching Puritan who was sort of the alter ego of Carnegie. Carnegie was much more personable, he was much more outgoing. He pictured himself as a person who had good relations with his workers. Frick was much sterner. Carnegie saw in Frick a competent manager and named him president of Homestead on July 1st, 1891, the same day that the union at Homestead had set as the deadline for wage negotiations. Carnegie skedaddled back to Scotland. Clearly Carnegie wanted to break that union, but he did not want to do it personally. So he put that into the hands of Henry Clay Frick. And during the Homestead strike, Frick called all the orders and took all the heat. When the workers walked out, all eyes were on Frick. Everyone wanted to see what Frick would do. His first action was to lock the man out of the mill. It was a clear message. Scabs would be brought in to break the strike. For three generations, the sweat from the steelworkers' brows had built Homestead. They would protect it at all cost. Frick had a secret plan. He would bring in 300 armed guards from the Pinkerton Detective Agency to guard the works. I think it's clear that Carnegie, Frick, uh, and the workers themselves understood that what the Homestead strike was about was not so much about the contract. It was about the existence of the union itself. It was about the destruction of, of the craft. The strike was about the company getting control over the process rather than the workers having control over it. The workers were determined to keep outsiders from entering the mill. Arriving at Homestead, the Pinkertons found angry workers lying in wait. 
The Pinkertons were ordered not to shoot unless the striker shot first. In all, over 10,000 angry laborers had gathered to protect the mill. Slowly, the armed guards filed off the boat, shotguns in hand. For a moment, all was still. And then a shot. To this day, no one is sure who fired first, but the ensuing battle cost the lives of three Pinkerton detectives and five steel workers. Over 90 were injured. The first bloody outburst would also be the last. The Pinkertons surrendered, and for a short time it looked as though the workers had won. For Frick, it had been a public relations fiasco, and he had lost control of the mill. And Carnegie's name would forever be tarnished by the bloody dispute. On July 6, the governor of Pennsylvania ordered 8,000 troops from the state militia to return control of the mill at Homestead to Frick. The rioting was over, but in one last bizarre twist, more blood would be shed. And it would be Frick's. He was working in his office on the afternoon of July 10th when a lone gunman burst into the room. He pulled a gun and shot Frick twice in the neck. Miraculously, Frick survived. For the surgery that followed, he even refused anesthetic and then returned to work to sign some papers later that same day. The attacker had been a Russian anarchist, not connected with the strike. Frick gained much needed sympathy from the public. He was simply a man doing his job. Carnegie was now seen by the public as the real culprit. Frick agreed. Frick was silently disapproving of Carnegie's position on labor. Carnegie, in public, presented himself as a friend of labor, but privately, he benefited from the stance that Frick took against the workers at Homestead. When the workers were ready to return to the table, Frick refused to negotiate. The men would come back to work on his terms. Unable to maintain the strike, the workers had little choice but to accept. Carnegie's grip on the steel industry was now absolute. He was about to become the richest man in the world, but Carnegie had even greater goals. He built the industry that would build America, but he wasn't finished building his dream. We now return to Steel on Modern Marvels. At the turn of the century, America was humming with the sounds of progress, and the nation's growth was fueled by the strongest material on earth, steel. And at the center of it all sat Andrew Carnegie. Not only had Carnegie built the industry, he also found new uses for steel products. The home insurance building in Manhattan was a good example. At first, the architects were reluctant to build higher than the usual six stories. But Carnegie suggested using a new steel beam reinforced at the bottom. This way, the weight of the building could be distributed evenly through the walls. It was an ingenious solution and an instant success. Once the Otis Elevator Company figured out a way to speed people to high floors, the race of the skyscrapers was on. Steel would support the greatest buildings on earth and make possible the American skyline of the 20th century. In 1900, at age 62, Carnegie did what he had vowed he would never do. He sold his company to his arch rival, J.P. Morgan. The sale made him one of the richest men in the world, with a fortune in excess of $350 million, over $10 billion today. He sold the company to fulfill his last great dream the dream of giving all his money away. But Carnegie was so wealthy that his money earned interest at a rate faster than it could be given away. Nevertheless, he would spend the rest of his days trying. J.P. Morgan added his own holdings to the Carnegie acquisition and called the new company U.S. Steel. He went public with the stock and U.S. Steel became so powerful that within nine months it had boosted the Dow Jones by 500%. The sale of Carnegie Steelworks made way for one of the most fascinating personalities in the steel business. Charlie Schwab was a born entrepreneur with a showman's flair. 
Charlie Schwab was born in Loretto, Pennsylvania, an extremely remote outpost at the top of the Allegheny Mountains that was founded by a Russian prince turned Catholic priest who, after the 1800s, moved a small group of German immigrants to a small village whose aim was to withdraw itself from the Industrial Revolution. Well, good old Charlie didn't really cotton much to this. Schwab, no relation to the founder of today's financial institution, left his small town and landed at the Edgar Thompson Steelworks. He showed promise and quickly rose through the ranks. Young Schwab made an immediate impression on Carnegie, who perhaps saw a little of himself in the polite but aggressive lad. By his early 30s, Schwab had become one of Carnegie's most trusted and valued managers. Of Schwab, Carnegie would later remember, Charlie is a genius. I have never met his equal, and when he had me as his partner, we were a great team. In Carnegie, Schwab had a mentor, but with Morgan the situation was different. Rumors about Schwab's gambling made Morgan nervous. A large company like U.S. Steel needed a strong, steady hand at the helm. As reward for bringing Carnegie and Morgan together, Schwab had been appointed president, but Schwab had competition. Charlie Schwab was the president, but somewhat to check him under the Morgan system was a lawyer named Albert Gary, and he too was taken aback by Schwab. Gary basically told Schwab that he had to keep a very low profile. Schwab insulted, refused, and left the company. But Schwab was determined to have the last word. So furious was Schwab at being rejected and such personal animosity to Gary that he began charting his comeback and he saw as his instrument Bethlehem Steel. Bethlehem Steel was a small supplier of armor plate, but Schwab saw a big potential. And he vowed to reporters who listened to him around 1904 that he would make this company the rival of U.S. Steel. Between 1907 and 1914, Schwab built Bethlehem into a first-rate supplier. A new process helped increase productivity. It was called the open hearth system. The open hearth utilized scrap steel. Scrap was dumped into the furnace and iron ore poured on top. Oxygen and hot air were then forced into the hearth from the side. A brick-lined chamber on the other side captured the heat which was then reused by reversing the flow of oxygen and hot air over the bricks. Scientific knowledge had improved and precise amounts of trace elements could be added to make the perfect mixture of steel. Production increased tenfold, but Schwab's success was nothing compared to what was about to happen with a little help from the Great War. By 1914, the shadow of war darkened Europe. England watched, wary and alarmed, as troops on both sides became entrenched in what promised to be a long, defensive war. Officially, America remained neutral. American businesses were prohibited from selling armaments to the combatants. But Schwab couldn't be bothered with the fine print of foreign policy, not when there was money to be made. Sailing to England under the name Alexander MacDonald to avoid detection, Schwab met with two men who would change the fate of Bethlehem Steel, Lord Horatio Kitchener and a young Winston Churchill. Schwab convinced Kitchener and Churchill to buy all their steel plate and armaments from his company. A lucrative deal in and of itself, but there was more to come. Bethlehem had recently acquired the Four Rivers shipbuilding plant for $750,000. During peacetime, a submarine sold for $250,000. Schwab convinced the English to order 20 of them at an astounding price of $500,000 apiece. If Schwab could pull it off, the deal would be the crowning moment of his career, but he would have to find a way around the official position of the U.S. government. Schwab's solution was to build the parts in America, but assemble them in England. It was a sleight of hand that added great wealth to the Bethlehem coffers and made his company a true competitor to his rival, U.S. Steel. Many believed that the end of World War I would bring an end to the lucrative expansion of the steel industry. But Schwab and other American steelmakers found that the country was changing. 
New opportunities were opening up as people moved from the country to the city. As people came off the farm for World War I to work in the factories, there needed to be canned food, food that could be preserved for, for a while in urban areas. People were no longer able to produce most of their food and consume most of their food on the farms. There had to be a way to take that food, to process it, and to bring it to an urban market. The new way was tin-plated steel cans. A new company, Campbell Soup, put in a contract to order 500 million cans per year. The swords of war were being turned not into plowshares, but into consumer goods. So this was a great period, a, a period of uh, expansion uh, into new markets. Uh, the uh, steel industry uh, was able to supply the materials that led to the great expansions in construction. And these looked like good times. It looked like the good times would never end. A man named Ford was making a fortune selling cars to the middle class. But the Great Depression changed the boom times of the 20s to bust. The once vibrant Wall Street was now in trouble and money for large building projects virtually disappeared. Men were laid off by the thousands as the grip of poverty wrapped its fingers around the once strong and powerful industry. The depression would prove disastrous for many Americans, most particularly for Charles Schwab. Charlie, throughout his life, was a gambler. He was a gambler in his business deals, and he was a gambler in personal life. He was very involved in the stock market, and it was later shown that he lost lots of money there. By the late 30s, he was essentially out of money. And in his final years of life, he died in 1939, he actually borrowed money from the order of priests that taught him in his little town of Laredo. Now, America's next great conflict was about to start a new chapter in the story of steel. As America began to struggle out of the Great Depression, the steel industry was desperately trying to stay profitable. World War II once again boosted demand. During the war, Franklin Roosevelt had dispensed with labor management conflicts by fixing the price of steel and demanding a halt to all labor strikes. The plan was successful since so much steel was produced that profits were handsome and overtime was plentiful. Besides, labor and management could put aside their differences to fight a common enemy overseas. But the end of the war ended the overtime. Returning soldiers created a plentiful supply of labor. The war's end also unleashed a flurry of pent-up consumer demand and created an explosion of building, and steel was a key ingredient. By the early 1950s, 85% of all manufactured goods contained at least some steel. But despite the demand, steel workers saw their wages stay the same. Roosevelt's policy of price fixing during the war was disastrous in a peacetime economy. Profits for other industries rose, but steel was stuck, despite the fact that demand had never been higher. Tin-coated steel cans were a good example. Over 50 million of them were used every day, over 17 billion a year. Facing a greater demand and desire to boost profits even higher, Steel companies looked at labor as the natural place to cut costs. But the steel worker wasn't about to give up without a fight. And for the first time, the unions would receive support from the federal government. The steel workers were ready to take on the owners once again. And it would be a confrontation with disastrous results for the world's strongest industry. Through the late 50s, labor and management struggled to reach an agreement. By 1959, the conflict had escalated into a crisis, and both sides left the bargaining table vowing not to return. That year, one of the longest, most devastating strikes in the history of the steel industry virtually shut down production for over four months. Building came to a standstill, and the lives of over half a million workers were put on hold. 120 days went by. There was no income. The union tried to muster up and meet at Morrell Park. 
and at times they would give out a ham or a turkey and some canned goods, and, and that's kind of the way you survived. As the strike wore on, it became clear to the steel executives that labor was determined. This time, the men would hold out. The mills were losing big money, and labor knew it. And this time, the government was on labor's side. Well, I think what finally allowed steel workers to organize was the kind of legislation that was coming out of the Roosevelt administration. After the Depression, the steel corporations were much more willing to give to labor for the sake of labor peace. Finally, management gave in and the workers' demands were met. But the promises made to labor in the late 50s would come back to haunt the steel industry in the 60s and 70s. In the early 1960s, American Steel, once the leader in the world, found itself facing new competition. The American consumer first was exposed to foreign steel in 1957 as a result of the U.S. Steel strike. This was the first time that North American consumers had a chance to sample foreign steels, and they found, much to their surprise, that the steel was of rather good quality. This, of course, set the stage for the future of imported steel into the country, which exists even to today. The 60s and 70s saw a once proud industry floundering, fat, unhealthy, and unable to respond to the evolving needs of a rapidly changing marketplace. Thousands lost their jobs as mills closed and small towns once vibrant and robust boarded up their main streets and their shops. In the late 70s and early 80s, the steel industry realized that to stay competitive in the new world marketplace, attitudes would have to change. But those of us that did survive had to change your philosophy. You had to come with the modern times. You had to realize that if you were going to be a survivor, you had to do more with less. Today, steel companies uh, spend large amounts of money on equipment and staff to provide high quality steel. By the late 80s, America was once again the leading supplier of the world's most vital manufacturing material. Steel allows you to build various devices, structures, machines at low cost. So steel is still going to play a central role in the uh, advancing technology of the next century. That is for sure. Today, a new artisan is at work, manufacturing American steel. Steel production is a high-tech, complex process where the artist uses a mouse rather than a ladle and a keyboard has replaced the thick wool jackets and the groove-tinted goggles of the steelmaker. Steel has joined the information age, but as the industrialization of America continues, steel is still the best material for products built to last. Tens of thousands of workers made a handsome living in mills that were five, six, sometimes seven miles long. The incredible output of 100 million tons a year seemed almost easy. While the industry itself has undergone major changes over the years, the process of making steel has remained remarkably consistent. Iron ore gives us iron, and iron is what's used to make steel. The difference between iron and steel is the amount of carbon in each of them. Steel is the product that results if carbon can be driven out of the iron. The greatest challenge to making steel was finding out a way to remove carbon from iron. For over 5,000 years, civilizations have been struggling to unlock the secrets of iron and steel. The first use of iron really involves taking pieces of meteorites. People were able to shape uh, these uh, fragments, these pieces of material, this metal from heaven, and it fascinated people. King Tut's tomb, dating back to 3000 BC, reveals the incredible value placed on iron. 
While the casket was made of gold, the iron implements of the young king were sewn into his garments. They included a mallet and a dagger. Iron was so valuable because of its mysterious origins. The discovery that iron existed just under the Earth's surface led to experiments which would soon uncover some of the mysteries of iron. The entire business of forging, puddling iron was considered the work of an artisan because so little was known scientifically that it was really handed down often father to son. By the 13th century, there were two ways to transform iron into steel. The first was to manually pound out the carbon and the other impurities. The second was to heat the iron to a temperature in excess of 2,500 degrees. This forced the carbon and other impurities out of the iron and left steel behind. For centuries, craftsmen could rarely achieve the 2,500 degree heat required to drive the carbon out of the iron. Since even an open flame only reaches 500 degrees, oxygen was blown in from the side to fan the flames. During the Middle Ages, improved methods for increasing the heat had been developed, but the manual process was still the only way that the carbon could be driven out. Hot liquid iron was strange and unpredictable. Those who knew its mysterious ways were treated like royalty. What's generally not understood is that steel is iron. Through the ages, there were groups that figured out processes that were handed down from ironmonger to ironmonger of making this refined type of iron that was steel, that was stronger, that wouldn't break during sword fights. One group, the Damascus sword makers, toiled over hot flames for 14 to 16 hours a day. With brute force, the iron was pounded again and again, the carbon driven out and a steel blade shaped like a sword was the result. One sword could take days to make. To test the blade, a slave was summoned, and his head was cut off. If the sword held its edge, it was ready for battle. No matter what the product, an ironsmith had to be as tough as the metal with which he worked. By the 1700s, England was the center of steel production, but soon England's iron industry was in trouble. The problem was finding a fuel to heat the iron. Wood from the forests was being depleted at an alarming rate. To make one ton of iron, it took 10 acres of forest. The tiny island nation that ruled the world found itself unable to meet its own energy needs. A new, undeveloped land across the ocean, America, offered England her best hope. But America's vast natural riches would prove difficult to tap. Colonists built the first mill in 1622 at Falling Creek, Virginia. They worked day and night, pressing every man and woman into service. The Native Americans living in the area were angered by the strange behavior of the intruders. Determined to drive them out, the Native Americans attacked the mill just as the first fire was being stoked. All 348 members of the colony were killed, save for one young boy who escaped to tell a neighboring village the grim tale of the attack. 22 years later, a mill was built in Saugus, Massachusetts, and the first American iron was made. The Industrial Revolution was just beginning, and colonial America was hungry for materials to build. But it became clear that the two types of iron, cast iron and wrought iron, had limitations. The cast iron is a very strong, however relatively brittle material. Wrought iron is lower carbon, but it doesn't have the strength of the cast iron. For America to be transformed into a juggernaut of industrial might, a way would have to be found to make steel affordable and easily available. And a brilliant entrepreneur was about to accidentally stumble onto a secret worth millions. We now return to steel on Modern Marvels. By the late 1860s, the age of iron had arrived. The iron horse linked the coasts. Over 50,000 miles of track had been laid. Travel was easier, but it wasn't always safe. 
there would be what was called snakes, which would be an iron rail that would break out of its moorings on a tie and would swing up, come through the wooden frame of a car and impale whatever was in its way. And this was one of the real awful and threats of traveling in those days. Iron brought America into the industrial age, but a stronger metal would be needed. It took an Englishman, Henry Bessemer, to unlock the great mystery of steel. Bright and ambitious, Bessemer had shown early in his life a penchant for inspired invention. Bessemer, penniless and desperate to make money to marry, invented a perforated stamp which put an end to the English practice of illegally reusing stamps over and over. His invention saved the British Post over 100,000 pounds a year and made him a wealthy man, but it was nothing compared to what was in store. Bessemer was about to solve one of the greatest mysteries of the industrial age. In England, they were producing this crucible steel. The question that was on everyone's mind was how could we produce a product comparable to say the crucible steel of Sheffield England on a large